Hello, Augies. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, OG for Augie, here with episode 128 of Ask Dave. Recently, an Augie asked me what he could do with several acres of land he had on which he could direct antennas. Well, the answer came to mind immediately. An antenna that had its heyday back in the 1930s and during World War II, the rhombic. Never heard of it? <laughs> it's a fabulous antenna with fabulous gain of up to 16 dBi or even more, an incredibly low radiation elevation angle, lower than 10 degrees even, and phenomenal beam sharpness. Back in the early 1930s, it was the cat's meow for long distance shortwave link providers like telephone and telegraph companies, as well as the military. It was used during the war by the British Y service, the folks who copied German code to feed to the boffins at Bletchley Park. It's a magnificent antenna. Well, before we talk about what happened to it, let's take a closer look at the antenna and its capabilities. The antenna is a balanced, horizontal, traveling wave antenna that is several wavelengths long. It's shaped like a rhombus. A rhombus is like a squashed square, sort of a diamond shape, just like the ARRL logo. By the way, the fact that the ARRL logo is a rhombus is not a coincidence. So the two halves of the antenna are sort of like an angled clam shell. Each half of the antenna is a big V. The lengths of all the sides are equal. The thing that separates this from a loop is that the antenna is open at the end. In the open configuration, the antenna is highly bidirectional. But by terminating the antenna in its characteristic impedance, around 800 ohms, most of the energy that would radiate backwards is absorbed, and the antenna becomes very much unidirectional. Here's an ancient photograph from a Hugo Gernsback publication that shows a rhombic that was in the San Francisco Bay Area and was used to communicate point to point with Shanghai, China. Given the massive gain and by using a little frequency agility on this very broadband antenna, this channel could be kept open most of the day. There are a couple things to notice about this antenna. First, it's huge. Each leg of the rhombus is three to four wavelengths long. So if this were a 20 meter antenna, each leg would be say 60 meters or about 200 feet long, giving a circumference of 800 feet. Oh, and it's up about 100 feet or so in the air. The photograph is taken with a telephoto lens, which foreshortens the perspective and makes it appear more square than it really is. This antenna is a monster. It encloses over an acre, but boy, did it work well. Okay, let's dig in. The antenna was not an accident and didn't just appear out of nowhere. It was actually developed by a few brain boxes at Bell Labs in the very late 1920s and early 1930s to solve a specific problem. That problem was keeping shortwave circuits open around the clock for its overseas telephone service. This was before transatlantic telephone cables. TAT1 didn't come online until 1956. This was before communication satellites. Telstar didn't come on until the early 1960s. And as an aside, I happened to watch the first transatlantic television broadcast live. Boy, that dates me. But back in the 1930s, you sent a telegram or you waited for the overseas operator to set up a telephone call via shortwave. It was a very expensive service. So let's look at this patent. Note that it was filed in 1931 and was not granted until the United States was already busy with World War II. That's 11 years later. That's a long time for a patent to be in review. In 
That means that during the 1930s, other folks were using rhombics because AT&T didn't yet have patent protection. Plus, during the war, the U.S. Army and Navy used whatever technology they needed. When we look back on that period, the 1930s, even though the world was in the grip of the Great Depression, these were the glory days for shortwave radio. Good thing, too, because war was on the horizon and the technology helped us win the war. Anyway, let's look at the drawings in the patent. This is a plan view looking down on the antenna. You can readily see the diamond shape. The antenna is fed on the left end and there's an impedance at the right side. In this side view drawing, the antenna is held pretty level in the air, at least a half wavelength eye. In previous videos about dipoles, yagis, and so on, we discovered that a half wavelength was about the optimum height for a horizontally polarized antenna. We'll find here that even higher works well for rhombics. During the 1930s and during World War II, a company called Press Wireless had a receiving station atop the Palos Verdes Peninsula, a bit west of Long Beach. Back then, it was open farmland. Press Wireless had put their receive site there because it was elevated by several hundred feet and because, and this may seem very strange, at that time, the Palos Verdes area was well away from Los Angeles and all its noise. This is true. In fact, I can remember as a boy going out with my parents to the newly constructed Los Angeles International Airport way out in the boonies in farmer's fields. <laughs> well, it's not in the boonies anymore. Anyway, at the end of World War II, Don Wallace, W6AM, a resident of Southern California, purchased the Press Wireless site. You see him here in front of the Press Wireless Operations Building. Don became sort of the king of the rhombic antenna. He used the ones left over by Press Wireless and added many more, pointed in many different directions. He had an awesomely complex switching network to pick the right rhombic and tune it up. He became famous for his enormous AM signal and was at the top of the heap for DX and contesting awards. And this is before single sideband made its appearance in ham radio. Although I lived in the area during the 1980s, sadly, I never met him. I sure heard about him though. Northrop was my employer and our Northrop club field days were held up on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. I remember looking down at Los Angeles and its millions, <laughs> literally millions, of lights. Okay, so here's what the current ARRL antenna book has to say about the classic terminated rhombic antenna. The angle theta is called the tilt angle, even though nothing is tilted. Over the decades, many design formulas have been developed to optimize the length L, the tilt angle theta, and the termination resistance R. Now, I will mention here that the termination resistance R basically absorbs all the RF energy that would otherwise create a back lobe that's just as big as the front lobe. The point is to get rid of the back lobe. But you ask, couldn't you use some reactive components to store that unused energy and release it back into the antenna? in the proper phase to radiate forward? The answer is yes, yes you can. But then the reactive element only works on a specific frequency, which sort of defeats the wide band nature of the antenna. Well, can't you just make it adjustable? Well, yes you can. If you're a rich overseas wireless company, it takes some serious sophistication, so hams usually stick with the terminating resistor. Okay. So here's the design from the ARRL antenna handbook that we'll implement. It's kind of big for my one acre lot here in Colorado. Like, way big. I know this will 
disappoint you because you expected video of utility scale trucks and poles and thick hard drawn wire, but the only way I can implement it is in the computer using EZNEC+. Here's the model, which I made by adjusting an example loop file that came with the software. I'll admit it took me a few hours to get it to work. These are the three critical screens. The main screen, which shows I opted to use real copper wires so that resistance and heat loss is taken into account, and the antenna is over a normal ground. The loads box shows that wire 5 is actually only a foot long, but has a purely resistive impedance of 800 ohms. Otherwise, everything is 12 gauge hard drawn copper wire. Note over here that while EZNEC Plus likes 50 ohms, like everyone else, it will happily use an alternative characteristic impedance if you like. So I chose 900 ohms, since that's actually about the feed impedance for a rhombic. This video shows the antenna in three dimensions. This is actually an isometric projection rather than a perspective projection, but it still gives you an idea how big the antenna is. It's huge. It looks like it hugs the ground, but it doesn't. It's way up in the air. Okay, the ARRL antenna book says this design is optimized for 20 through 10 meters. So I did simulations on 20, 15, and 10 meters. I tried them at different heights based on a half wavelength and then higher in increments. We'll see some behavior we've seen before when exploring simulations. This is for 20 meters. I picked 14.175 megahertz because it's in the middle of the band. If we put the antenna a half wavelength in the air, we find a gain of about 13.6 dBi, and that's even with the loss of the reflected power in the 800 ohm impedance. As you go higher, note that the gain, look at the right hand side, goes up a bit as the height goes up. And, really important, look at what happens to the beam elevation as the antenna goes higher in the air. Wow we can get the elevation angle down below 10 degrees. Amazing! Note also that the side lobe pattern is extraordinarily complex, but all the power in those side lobes is insignificant compared to the power in the main lobe. But notice that as the height goes up, a secondary main lobe gets bigger. We saw this same behavior when we elevated dipoles beyond a half wavelength. Okay, let's look at 15 meters. The lobes tend to converge a bit as the antenna gets higher in terms of a couple wavelengths. But look at that main lobe. It goes all the way down to six degrees. And that's over a standard ground and with the resistance in a copper line considered too. Wow, nearly 18 dBi gain. That's fantastic. Now for 10 meters or 28 megahertz. We see the same pattern here in that the main lobe comes down in elevation as the antenna is elevated. Again, down to 6 degrees and nearly 16 dBi of gain. Wow! Now, we need to deal with the characteristic impedance of the antenna. Note that this is in fact a balanced antenna. <laughs> in the original 1931 patent document, Edmund Bruce says that the lower half of the antenna is merely a counterpoise to the upper half. Today, would, we would simply call this a balanced antenna, which is what it is. The characteristic impedance is about 800 or so ohms. This chart shows the SWR if the antenna is fed with plain old 50 ohm coax. Yuck! At 10 megahertz, we're looking at an SWR of 19.2. No good. But remember that I also had the system calculate the SWR for a feed line of 900 ohms. We get this chart showing a delightful SWR across a very broad band from 10 to 30 megahertz. But this does leave us with a bit of a problem. How do we feed this antenna? <laughs> 
If you want it to work on only one band, you can use matching stubs. Or you can get or build an 18 to 1 ballon to put right at the feed point and then feed it with ordinary coax. And yes, you can do that. Or you can use 900 ohm open wire line, which will have less loss than that coax. 900 ohm line, where do you get that? Well, you make it, of course. Given the high impedance nature of the antenna, you don't need very thick wire. 16 or 14 gauge will do. This chart from the ARRL Antenna Handbook shows how widely you need to space the wires to get the impedance you want, or you can figure it out from the formulas given in the book. So if you use number 16 wire, just create spacers about 18 inches wide, that's all. Run this from the antenna to your shack and then use an 18 to 1 ballon and you're in business. Okay, well that was fun. Clearly there are some serious issues with the rhombic. One is the sheer size. You need lots of land and some very tall poles. And, and this is the worst problem, it doesn't rotate. So if you want to work in another direction, you need to put up another rhombic. That didn't bother Don Wallace, W6AM. He had the land and the money to put up multiple rhombics over the years. If you've got the land, the money, and the inclination, you can still do the same, though I think you'll find that a big Yagi will work nearly as well and can be rotated to point anywhere you need. So that was a fun diversion from the plethora of product reviews and antenna topics that you can actually reasonably implement. I hope you enjoyed it. A little history digression is fun from time to time. If you do indeed build a full-scale rhombic, do send me photos. In channel news, please click like, please subscribe, please investigate the tip jar and my Patreon page. The latter two are available at dcastler.com support. I also have thumb drives available with the amateur extra training videos. Thank you so much for your continuing support. Until we next meet, 73. Next week, we'll take a close look at the Redivus Islands HD1 dual band DMR handheld.